We are uh, delighted to have two um, presenters this evening. Um, first, we'll have uh, Peter Neumann. Is that, am I pronouncing that right? No, that's good. Okay, Peter Neumann, um, who is the director for the International Center for the Study of Radicalization and Political Violence. Did I get that all right? <laughs> and um, he's also a professor, and actually he's here this, just this year teaching at Georgetown University. So we really lucked out. Normally he's based out of uh, the UK. Um, so it just so happened that this, this uh, iteration of USIP that he was going to be in town. So we're very lucky to have him here with us. And our presenter for the second half of class, uh, class is uh, Shaska Byerly. Um, she um, used to work for ICNC, actually. She used to be the vice president of, of ICNC. And now she's uh, one of the leading researchers on the intersection of civil resistance and anti-corruption campaigns and movements. So we'll be spending some time in the second half of class looking at some specific examples of, of anti-corruption campaign. Um, so just, just to um, kind of lead into to Peter's presentation, some of you may be wondering why would we be looking at um, uh, extreme violence or terrorism in a civil resistance nonviolent conflict class. Um, and Jack kind of touched on this on the first class, if you remember, talking about how Oftentimes, civil resistance and nonviolent conflict is, is not understood or not seen as, a, as an effective way to wage uh, a conflict, uh, to wage a conflict where people are living under intolerable conditions in a corrupt society, where their rights are being abused or violated. And so they see that violence, in many ways extreme violence, is the only option that they have. So in many ways, civil resistance is being seen as a way to combat extreme forms of violence and, and terrorism. But in order to do that, we have to get a better understanding of why people use extreme forms of violence, what that actually means, um, so we can um, appropriately apply or understand where that intersection takes place with civil resistance. Um, so with that, I hand it over to Peter. Thank you very much. And I'm going to stand up because I speak better when mm -hmm. I stand up. Usually, I, I, I like lecterns even, but since we don't have a lectern. And let me start because you talked about citizen journalism. Last week, I was in San Francisco, and we went to a lot of... Um, you know, really big internet companies. I mean, we had the, one of the founders of Google speak to us, one of the founder of LinkedIn, Yelp.com, etc. And what made me really happy listening to all these very wealthy and successful people is that all of them used PowerPoint, but none of them had anything but a terrible PowerPoint presentation. So all these super accomplished people, these giants of the information revolution, could not apparently put together a decent PowerPoint. That made me feel a lot better about my, <laughs> my, my PowerPoint. And please do not expect uh, too much from mine. So the topic I want to talk about today is uh, civil resistance and extreme violence, specifically uh, uh, terrorism. And you know, you've already given half of my introduction, namely that you know a lot of people that you may talk to and that may be interested in engaging in civil resistance may come back to you and respond to you uh, by saying, you know, we were attacked, so the only option we had was to fight back. Other people may say it's better than doing nothing. Violence is the most effective weapon against abuses, and it does help to mobilize people. So people instinctively seem to think that violence because it is so much more extreme and intense than nonviolence, perhaps, um, that it must be more effective and it must be a more committed strategy of pursuing your political aims. The question is, are these statements actually true? Well, there's a short answer and there's a long answer. The short answer is that they are not true and that, by and large, terrorism doesn't work as a strategy for achieving political aims. And what I will spend the next perhaps half hour on is to give you the long answer, namely to explain to you why it doesn't work. But don't take my word for it. Look at this particular kind of statistic that was put together by two colleagues here at the, at the ICNC, by Erica Chenoweth and by Maria Stepan. They actually quantitatively looked at all the conflicts that have happened since the turn of the 20, well, do you say 20th century? Since 1900 um, to 2006. 
And they've countered a lot of conflicts, a lot of violent conflicts, and a lot of nonviolent conflicts. And this statistic does not just include cases of terrorism, it includes all forms of violent struggle. And what they found was that in almost all of the cases, the nonviolent forms of conflicts and nonviolent campaigns turn out to be more successful than the violent ones. In terms of success, you have like an over 50% success rate in the case of nonviolent strategies being employed, and uh, a little bit more than 20% only in the case of violent campaigns. And the same goes for partial success and failure. So, based on the empirical evidence alone, you can say that nonviolent campaigns are by and large more successful than violent ones. And if you don't believe those statistics because they were produced by people who receive money from ICNC and are therefore perhaps uh, uh, you know, kind of influenced in a particular way, you can also look at other studies that have been done. Max Abrams, for example, has you know, done a similar study on the effectiveness of terrorism. And I and a colleague of mine, Mike Smith, we have published an entire book about the strategy of terrorism. And in fact, only this morning in my office, I picked up this latest issue of the Strategic Studies Quarterly, which contains another study that shows the exact same result. It's titled uh, uh, How Terrorist Groups End Studies of the 20th Century. It's written by Chris Harmon. And if you look at that, and I will hand it around in a second, you can see that you know, there's plenty of cases of terrorist campaigns that have failed, but only very, very few of those that have succeeded. And of course, arguably, there are tricky cases. There are tricky cases where you can argue, well, has that campaign really failed? Has it perhaps partially succeeded? Uh, and I'm sure you have opinions about some of these tricky cases. You know, for example, Chris Harmon here counts the PLO's campaign Palestinian Liberation Organization's campaign as a partial success. I would count it as a failure. I don't think they have achieved their stated aims. I think they've arguably made the situation a lot worse for the Palestinians that they are claiming to represent. But, you know, arguably, you can put arguments back and forth, and you can probably spend the rest of the night arguing about whether that, that particular campaign was a success or failure. But the overwhelming picture remains, namely the terrorist campaigns in most cases, do not succeed. So what I want to talk about is why they don't succeed and touch on several points here. The nature of terrorist violence, just very briefly. Terrorism as a strategy, how does it actually work? How do people that engage in terrorist campaigns, terrorists, how do they imagine that they can turn you know, acts of violence into political success? The dynamics of strategic terrorism, where we talk about some of the flawed assumptions that are underlying campaigns of terrorism, and then we conclude. First of all, let's very briefly talk about terrorist violence. Terrorism is a form of violence. It's a tactic, sometimes a strategy, if you use it predominantly. Um, what makes it different from other forms of violence? Clearly, terrorism, in, terrorism involves violence, but not all violence is terrorism. And I guess there are two characteristics of terrorism that are quite unique and that distinguish terrorism from other kinds of military campaigns. First of all, terrorist violence is almost always extra normal. It's about terrifying people, hence the word terrorism. It should go beyond the boundaries of what is accepted as normal violence in any given society. Any society has a certain level of violence. But in order to terrify people, you have to go beyond the expected norms of violence. And that differs from society to society. Um, violence, the impression of what is accepted or normal in terms of violence, differs very much on where you live. So in a place like Switzerland, um, the expected level of violence will be very different from a place like Chechnya. And so as a terrorist, in order to get into the newspaper, in Switzerland, you, ha you will have to do less than you will have to do in Chechnya. But in any case, in order to terrify people, you need to engage in extra normal violence. And the second characteristic, and arguably the more important one, and more distinctive one, is that terrorism is almost always a symbolic form of violence. The targets of terrorist acts are not, are, are representing your actual target. They are not the actual targets. So, 
when Osama bin Laden was attacking the World Trade Center, it wasn't any particular person inside the World Trade Center that he wanted to kill. He was attacking the World Trade Center as a symbol of American power. The same goes for almost any other uh, terrorist act. When violent acts are meant to actually achieve tangible results, like smashing an enemy's army or occupying a particular piece of territory, you're no longer talking about terrorism, you're talking about conventional military strategy. But what makes terrorism unique is that you're not actually trying to smash the enemy's army, you're not actually trying to occupy a particular piece of lower Manhattan, you're trying to intimidate your opponent and you're trying to communicate a message to your opponent through an act of violence. And that's why we're talking about terrorism as a form of symbolic violence. And that's very important to understand, that for every terrorist act, there needs to be an audience. The message thing only works if you have an audience. And arguably, therefore, terrorism is a form of vicious communication. It is a battle of wills played out in people's minds. You're trying to manipulate the perceptions of a target audience. So, for example, let me ask you, when we're talking about 9-11, tax and World Trade Center, Pentagon, and perhaps another building in Washington. Who was the audience for that? And what kind of message were they trying to send? Ordinary people? Who? Uh, I mean, they you asked who was it? The, the audience, Amer audience, the American so, people. Yeah, I mean, oh, mm -hmm. the entire world. OK. And what were they trying to say to these people? that uh, we are here to beat you. OK. You're Any not involved Absolutely. The Any US other? Government. The US government, absolutely. What was it trying to say to the US government? That they've been arresting on our laws. <laughs> OK. Um, there is a legitimate threat out there. Okay. Any other? If I can borrow Eisenhower's words, actually, it was against the military industrial complex of the United States. Okay. Trying to say what? Essentially, that 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 the what they call the evil, if you will, mm -hmm. he is coming out of the military industrial complex, and that this need this is an indication. Otherwise, it was not randomly that they chose the Department of Defense and the towers. Actually, you know, so it was targeted in my way very very uh, carefully to send a message that this is the military industrial complex which is responsible for some of these. Okay. Unquote, unquote, evils according to them, and I'm not supporting them. Okay. If you ask actually what it means to me, that was the most significant mm -hmm. message that came out of that. Trump. I think there is. I think there is saying that your uh, your policies towards the Muslim world comes at a cost, and the cost is that you can never feel safe anywhere. Mm -hmm. That's very good. Absolutely, and and it, you've all sort of captured the idea, namely that. It's about manipulating someone's perception, in that case, the perception of, you know, in your case, Trant, the perception of the cost of American policy in the Middle East, okay? We're making that perception a little bit more expensive because we're showing you that this comes with a price. So the audience would be the American government, the American people was trying to send that message. One, one audience that perhaps you haven't mentioned is, um, you know, Muslims all over the world. Is that, is that an audience that perhaps he was trying to reach? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, did you have something to say? Well, yeah, absolutely, because he was trying to say, look, we are capable of hitting the most powerful nation absolutely. in the world yeah. in their military headquarters. Absolutely. Yeah. And that shows that we can do whatever we want, wherever we want to do it. So, and this is perhaps in our context, in terms of civil resistance, the most important aspect, because and I do believe that was one of the motivations of bin Laden, because in one of the videos that came out a couple of months after the attacks, he says that he's very disappointed that not more Muslims have risen up as a result of these attacks. So he clearly expected that this would have a mobilizing effect on some of the people who were sitting on the fence and perhaps thinking about supporting him. And that's an important aspect in this discussion, because clearly terrorists often believe 
that violence is mobilizing people. That, you know, people who are sitting on the fence, who are, you know, maybe sympathizing with the cause, but don't really believe that anything could be achieved, that, you know, this spectacular act of violence will make them rise up. Trump, you want I think there was also, and I say this as a European, a third audience, mm -hmm. with, which uh, was the European nations. Mm -hmm. Basically telling them, don't you side with the US, or this will happen to you too. And this message was, of course, strengthened through the Madrid and London uh, mm -hmm. bombings. So it, so it was a warning against allying with the US, trying to neutralize uh, the European nations. Very good. Nations. Very good. And whenever I give this uh, lecture to some people who are engaged in counterterrorism, I always say that this is perhaps the first sort of lesson to learn because if terrorism is about, you know, communicating with an audience and about trying to provoke a particular response, then the first task of any counterterrorist will be to understand what is the message that the terrorist is trying to, to send and not to do what he is hoping to provoke you into doing. Okay, so that's quite important. Yeah, yes. not to belabor the point, but yeah. you refer to the earlier, you know, point that uh, why did not the Muslims rise up? Mm -hmm. And I believe that's what Bilal said. One aspect or, or one interpretation of that was they did not expect any Muslim to write against the United States, mm. but it was against the old regimes, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And that's what Bin Laden was what, expecting. That was what the surprise was. Absolutely. You know, no one ever expected. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, there would be a violent Muslim uprising against the United States. No, 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 no. Against, against yeah. their respective the regimes in the Middle East. Absolutely. I just, I just yeah. have a question. Isn't, isn't that, um, I mean, to some extent, Muslims in Pakistan mm -hmm. have risen up. I mean, with the, the growth of the Pakistani Taliban and, and sort of an investment in the mm -hmm. tribal territories in terrorist violence, um, which we you know, mm -hmm. see, now there may be other forces at, at play here, but... Um, okay, I mean, maybe, but still, I think Bin Laden would probably argue it's not, not enough not and not soon enough. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's move on quickly, because I want to draw out uh, a number of more general points and talk about terrorism as a strategy and go back to what I just said and kind of gave away already. But think about the sort of strategies that terrorists are employing. And why do they think that with an act like 9-11, which was the most significant terrorist attack in known history, but even with you know, lesser kinds of terrorist attacks, that, that will deliver them political gains or political victory. And one of the sort of most important strategies is a really old one. And it came up, it was first formulated in the 19th century by anarchists and is called the propaganda of the deed. And that is precisely what I was talking about just now. The idea behind the propaganda of the deed is that action speaks louder than words and that these kinds of terrorist acts are actually a means of mobilizing your supporters or your latent supporters, your sympathizers, because you're demonstrating to them that you are making progress that the revolution is coming, that you are on their side, and that they better join um, the train before it is too late. The anarchists in the 19th century, in Russia especially, put that into pra practice. They said, you know, all this leafletting, all these protests and boycotts, all this nonviolent resistance stuff, it's never going anywhere. We're tired. People don't listen. Let's do something really dramatic and transform the nature of political discourse in our society from one day to the next. And that's what they did. And indeed, late 19th century, early 20th century, anarchist violence was the most significant form of terrorism. They assassinated one US president. Which one? McKinley. McKinley, absolutely. An anarchist assassinated a US president. They assassinated the Russian Tsar, Alexander II. And, and all, all that was based on the idea that forms of terrorist violence are a way of awakening the masses and getting perhaps latent supporters to join you and to become part of your movement. So propaganda of the deed from the anarchists to bin Laden is a strategic motive, a motif, 
that has been recurring for more than a century and a half. A second strategy that is always very prominent amongst terrorist movements is a strategy that was first articulated, not first practiced, but first articulated by Carlos Marighella, the leader of the Communist Party of Brazil, who was, I think, assassinated in 1970. And he wrote this short book that you can find everywhere on the internet, The Mini Manual of the Urban Guerrilla, and argues that one of the key tasks of any terrorist movements is to provoke the government into responding with repression. Why would you want to do that? You get more allies that way. Why do you get more allies? Because you're the victim. Because you're the victim. You're the victim? Absolutely. And the more people that the government is repressing, the more people have a beef with the government for being repressed. Exactly. So the idea is that through selected acts of terrorism, you're provoking the government into using curfews, arresting people, internment without trial, banning parties, banning newspapers, all the rest of it. And all these people that are hit by this terrible repression are going to be radicalized. And they will argue, well, it's the government that is doing that to us. And therefore, the government will be blamed rather than the terrorists. It's a sort of form of reverse psychology. You're provoking the government to do really awful things the people will start blaming the government for the repression that they are experiencing. And that was a strategy that worked very well for a lot of communist groups. Why? Because they believed that all these governments were fascist anyway, and that all you had to do is to expose their fascism for what it really is. Okay? So um, it was very clear that that seemed attractive to a lot of groups in Latin America, but also to some of the communist groups in Western Europe that were active in the 70s and 80s. And they all religiously followed the mini-manual of the urban guerrilla. Okay? They all, you could, you know, whenever there was an arrest, you know, in West Germany or in France or wherever, they would always find that particular book in the possession of some of these terrorists. And they all believed that that would work. Okay? They all believed that if only you provoked enough repression, finally the people that we have for years unsuccessfully tried to persuade of the righteousness of our cause will finally see the government for what it is, namely being fascist, and they will rise up and they will join us. That was um, Marighella's theory. Now, there are, there, there, there are other kinds of strategies as well, but these are really the two dominant ones. And if I had more time, I could explain all of them. But what's really more important, after I've, all, after I've sort of persuaded you that terrorism is a great idea, um, perhaps to sort of deconstruct uh, some of these ideas and tell you why I believe they don't work. And that's what I'm uh, going to do now. Basically, what I'm arguing and what the book that I and my colleague have written is arguing is that these strategies are resting on a number of very questionable assumptions. And I will give you one, two, three, four, four, four and a half of them. Um, the first overly optimistic assumption is that people can easily be alienated from the government, that people can easily be pushed into no longer supporting the government that a few acts of terrorism are enough in order to disabuse people of their basic loyalty to the people that are governing them, even if they are not governing them very well. And you can see examples of that all over the place. One example that I'm quite familiar with and that I'm always using is the case of the IRA in Northern Ireland, whose attacks in Britain that they engaged in throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s were always aimed at precisely that idea. The idea was that if we start attacking things in London, then people will tell the government to leave Northern Ireland. Okay? But if you look at opinion polls, whenever the IRA attacked 
in mainland Britain, in London, in England, you know, actually support for the government to counter and destroy the IRA was rising. So the effect was exactly the opposite from what the terrorists had, uh, had hoped to achieve. By attacking in London, they were hoping that the British people would tell the government, let's get out of Northern Ireland, let's stop the violence. But what actually happened was that in opinion poll after opinion poll, you can see that the number of people supporting almost any measure to counter terrorism in Northern Ireland was rising. Another example is what happened in Jordan in 2005, when Abu Musab al-Zarqawi was attacking the hotels in Amman. The reaction of the people in Jordan was not as he hoped. It was exactly the opposite, namely that people were rising up against Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. And for the first time, there was a genuine mass mobilization in the Middle East against this kind of terrorism. So this assumption that through an act of violence, you can alienate people from government, perhaps it works in one or two cases. I'm not excluding that. But by and large, the empirical evidence seems to be not very supportive of that assumption. By the way, I'm not saying that the assumptions of the terrorists never hold true. There may be a few cases, and in the most exceptionally benign circumstances, it may in fact work. And I, I do think that in period of decolonization, directly after the Second World War, when you had foreign occupation, when you had exceptionally unpopular regimes with very little legitimacy, some of these mechanisms worked. But in the vast majority of cases, these assumptions are indeed flawed. Yes? Um, when using the example of the IRA, yeah. um, could, couldn't you counter, um, counter those opinion polls um, in, on, the, on mainland Britain with opinion polls um, of Northern Irish, that, mm -hmm. um, specifically Catholics that were living um, in Northern Ireland at the time, after um, a terrorist attack um, that was tribute to the IRA on, in Northern Ireland? Mm -hmm. So I feel like while I, I um, what you had said was true about the um, British opinion polls, mm. I, I think that in some ways, especially in the beginning, um, that the, ter the acts of, of terrorism that were committed by the IRA in Northern Ireland were um, garnered a little bit more support from sure. the, the Catholic population, and then also sure. when um, the British <coughs> government came in, um, absolutely that. That definitely motivated people and brought absolutely. more people. Absolutely, and you, you're absolutely right. And I think that within Northern Ireland, it's certainly true that the sort of acts of violence that followed repression by the government had the most legitimacy. So immediately after Bloody Sunday, for example, in January 1972, when the British Army killed 13 protesters, a lot of people joined the IRA, and support for the IRA was very strong. And certainly, you can argue that immediately after these sorts of incidents, uh, support rose. But by the 1980s, when most of the terrorist attacks were carried out in England, you could actually see that even within Northern Ireland, Catholics were no longer supportive of this. And arguably, the clever thing that they did at that particular point was to actually gradually go away from violence and try to engage politically because they realized that people were getting tired of it. So, you know, I agree. To some extent, you're right. Trump. I also wanted to mention about this Sunday. Yeah. Because I see that more as an example, or the, the reason why it increased support for IRA and other, other nationalists was because it was a nonviolent act. Yes, absolutely. From the, uh, from the Republican side. Absolutely. That was repressed. Good point. Had it Good been point. an act of terror, Absolutely. which had been responded to in the same way by the government, it wouldn't have had the same effect absolutely. in mobilizing people for the IRA and, uh, and yeah, the absolutely right. yeah, absolutely right. Now let's quickly go through some of the other assumptions. Second overly optimistic assumption, I believe, is that repression is always unpopular. Terrorists assume that repression is always unpopular. I don't think necessarily that is the case. And if you look at, for example, some of you may know history of Latin America, especially in the 60s and 70s, you will see that a lot of the authoritarian regimes which came in, in places like Argentina or Uruguay, 
came in or took power as a result of low-level terrorist and insurgent campaigns. In the case of uh, Argentina, what were they called the Montoneros or were they in Uruguay? Well, one of the two. Um, in both cases, you had a low-level uh, terrorist campaign um, that annoyed people and that got people to the point where they were actually calling for military dictatorship to be launched. The military leadership in both countries at that point actually embraced the opportunity to take over government in these countries because they knew that at the beginning at least they were doing so with the support of the people. The terrorists had annoyed the population rather than getting their support they had annoyed the population to the point where they were asking for military dictatorship to come in and to clean the mess up. So rather than you know, people fearing repression and blaming the government and joining the insurgents, rather the country, they were demanding for military dictatorship to come in, at least initially. Argentina, of course, it turned around very quickly, but at least initially, that was supported by the people. And in Uruguay, they even had elections, fair elections initially after the dictatorship came in, and they were overwhelmingly confirmed in office. So rather than bringing about some positive change, some of these campaigns actually made the situation much worse. Third overly optimistic assumptions, the terrorist groups will survive brutal repression. And that's a very important point, especially from the point of view of civil resistance. And that's the argument that if you read the sort of serious social movement literature, uh, that is always being advanced as a counterpoint to violence. Because, of course, if you use violence as a civil resistance movement, you give the government the excuse to activate their own repressive machinery. With the result that, especially since you're weaker than the government, your chances of survival are often quite slim. Going back to the example that I cited at the very beginning, the Russian anarchists, they managed to eliminate, to kill, Tsar Alexander II. Tactical success. The consequence of that, however, was that the Russian government came down so hard on them that they didn't survive the repression that followed. So yes, they eliminated that symbol of, of the monarchy, but indirectly they eliminated themselves because they gave the government the excuse to activate their whole repressive machinery and to eliminate their group and probably a lot of other people too. Okay? So the moment you engage in violence, you're giving carte blanche to the government to do all sorts of things that perhaps it doesn't dare doing as long as you are nonviolent. You're activating the repressive machinery of the government and that can have terrible consequences not just for the population at large but for your own group because you are a small, weak group. You don't have the same means that the government have. And if you meet the government on its own terms, namely by violent means, you're unlikely to survive. And that's what happened in many cases. As it happened, for example, in the case of Argentina, where the terrorists and insurgents were eliminated, tens of, other, tens of thousands of other people too. But that wasn't of much help to the people who were launching that campaign because they died as well. So I think that's, that's a very important optimistic assumption that often terrorists are not thinking through. Yes? If, if, um, may I just mention for those um, who are not familiar of with course. the photo um, that this was actually um, papers countering the terrorist group with the, the emergence of a nonviolent um, dissent campaign in Argentina, which was actually successful. In yes, absolutely. And it was. So th they were not the terrorists. They were not, they were not the terrorists. They were absolutely. Not the terrorists. Absolutely. I should have mentioned that. Um, and the final over-optimistic assumption before I come to my final point, which is that terrorism will necessarily terrify people. And I think that's an overly optimistic assumption too. Of course, you can easily find examples of um, terrorist campaigns that do terrify people and that do genuinely lead to them being shattered in their sense of stability. 
But if you actually go through the psychological literature on this, you will be surprised by how marginal the effect is. And one of the best documented cases is the case of Israel, because it's you know, an advanced country where a lot of people have studied the psychological effects of terrorist violence. And what you see, if you look at any of the studies that were, for example, carried out during the period of the Second Intifada at the beginning of the last decade, you will see that even though almost every Israeli either has witnessed a suicide bombing or has a friend or a relative who have either witnessed a suicide bombing or have been wounded or been killed in a su suicide bombing. Um, the incidence of psychological trauma or any other effect is surprisingly small. It is smaller even at the height of the Second Intifada than in many Western countries that are not affected by terrorists. Uh, so the idea that the terrorists can easily shatter the stability or so psychological mental health of a country, that they can easily terrify people, is overly optimistic. And in the case of Israel in particular, you have to imagine that um, 2003, I think, uh, in some of the months, there were 30 suicide bombings a month, almost one on average per day. A huge amount of things were going on in that country. Imagine one suicide bombing in the United States of America, you know, months of coverage on Fox News would follow. Uh, but there was, on average, a suicide bombing a day for several months. And still, when people were asked in opinion polls, for example, about their confidence in the future of their country, it was actually higher than before the beginning of that campaign. So the idea that you can easily manipulate people into no longer supporting their country or their government is overly optimistic. People are not as terrified as we often believe. They are more resilient than we often believe. Yes. Can I ask you if you could go as far as, far as to say that you're actually building resilience? I think so. I think, I think in, the, in the case, I think it's, um, it depends on a number of factors. And that would be an, an, an entirely different lecture in its own right. <laughs> but, but I think that by and large, one can say that people are more resilient than terrorists expect them to be. Um, so my final point is this. If you're a terrorist, you're faced with a huge dilemma. If your first attack fails to induce the desired effect, so if you're, if, if you're doing your first attack, you're starting your campaign, your first attack is not leading to the desired result. How can you sustain your strategic momentum beyond the first series of attacks? What can you do knowing that the longer you carry on, um, the more um, people's resilience actually increases. Well, there are two options. The first option is that you do exactly that. You carry on as usual. The problem is that every study has shown if terrorist campaigns go, f go on for a very long time, people become indifferent. Human beings are funny in that respect because no matter how terrible the situation is, people at some point develop coping mechanisms and they get used to it. There's a loss of momentum and you're fading into insignificance. In the same way in which, for example, the IRA in the early 1990s was no longer having the effect that the first few bombings had. In the same way in which ETA, for example, until very recently, until ETA in the Basque country declared its ceasefire, was attacking from time to time, but it was no longer making any impact. They were attacking gas stations in the middle of Spain. They were attacking various targets in the Basque country. They were killing a policeman from time to time. But I don't think even they expected that as a result of that, the Spanish government would one day go, oh, you killed a policeman. There you have your country. No? So they lost the strategic momentum. And in fact, you know, having lived in Spain, many of these attacks didn't even make it on the front page of the newspaper anymore. So basically, the longer your campaign carries on and you're not changing taxic, tactics, the smaller your impact will be. Option two is, of course, to escalate and to increase the intensity of your campaign, to increase the sort of 
violence that you're using or the terrifying effect of your tactic. The problem here is that if you escalate too much, potentially you're losing popular support and you're giving the government a free hand to crush you. And that's of course exactly what happened in Iraq with Al-Qaeda. They were going overboard. And at some point, their natural constituency, the Sunnis of Iraq and the Sunni Triangle, who were populating some of the insurgent groups, were turning against Al-Qaeda and starting to support and work with the American government. If you had told someone in 2005 that two years later, all these Sunni tribes would be paid by the American government, would be supporting the American government against Al-Qaeda, you would have been laughed at. But that's exactly what happened because they fell into what we would call the escalation trap. They overdid it because they weren't achieving their goals. They were bombing more and more, and they were escalating their tactics to the point where people said, enough is enough. We support your aims, but what you're doing is crazy, and we will support um, your adversaries now. So if you're a terrorist, and I'm not advising you to be a terrorist, <laughs> I've often thought about it, but having studied this, my conclusion was that it probably doesn't work. Because either you're fading into insignificance or you're escalating too much. Getting the sort of am amount of violence exactly right is incredibly difficult and is probably beyond the means of most terrorists. So that would be my conclusion. Namely, that it is based on overly optimistic assumptions about governments and popular responses. And of course, you're faced with a huge dilemma unless you achieve your aims very, very quickly with one strike or a couple of strikes. Namely, as your campaign goes on, you're faced with the so-called escalation trap. Now, there's certainly a number of caveats. You know? And I would argue, to be fair, you know, that you know, some of these insurgencies, rather than strategic terrorist campaigns, insurgencies that are actually combining selected acts of violence with popular mobilization, probably increase the chances of success. And you certainly can ha have an argument about that. Um, but if you are thinking about using strategic terrorism, i.e. a campaign of violence that consists predominantly or only of acts of terrorism, I think you're almost certainly guaranteed to fail. So I would advise you, go for civil resistance rather than terrorism. Sorry. That's it. Now your questions. Please. I have a question, and that's with, regard your, uh, with regards to your definition of terrorism. OK. I, I'm not quite sure if you left out the notion of uh, terrorism is mostly targeted on civilians, and oh. that's a definition of uh, terror. Um, I didn't hear that in your definition. and also. Can you um, say that states can also be actors of terrorism? Absolutely. So what I was talking about mostly is sub-state terrorism. I think the dynamics work slightly differently for states, and that would be worth exploring in, a, in another lecture. But I'm not saying that if you, if you agree with me that terrorism ultimately is a particular tactic, a form of violence, then the logical extension will be that that tactic can be used by anyone for any purpose whether it is a state or a non-state actor. But what I was talking about was mo mostly about sub-state violence. Yes, oh, uh, and on the civilian question, I agree and I don't agree. I think that what I'm, I'm a strategist and I'm looking at a sort of military dynamics of particular campaigns. So I'm more interested in the sort of military elements of terrorism. I think that with Al-Qaeda and with some of the groups that we've seen over the past 10, 15 years, we've come more comfortable with the idea that terrorism is always targeted at civilians. But that was not necessarily the case in the 70s and 80s. So for example, the IRA did not routinely target civilians. What they were trying to do most of the time was to sort of kind of find kind of legitimate targets. It often went wrong. But in most cases, their aim, at least, and we're talking about the intention to target civilians, their aim was to target soldiers, policemen, 
technically they are civilians, but probably, you know, in the Northern Ireland context, you can argue about that. But they were not necessarily targeting civilians in the same way in which Al-Qaeda does today. So they were not blowing up uh, a marketplace or a coffee shop. If they did so, it usually was an accident. It happened very, very rarely, and certainly not on purpose. So I think our own definitions have shifted a little bit, and we're assuming terrorism to be more targeted towards civilians now than we used to. But in, in either case, I'm more interested in the sort of military uh, component of it. Yes, you had, and then we come to you. Um, have you. Have you looked at the, uh, whether um, a life of a um, terrorist group depends on, on its... Um, financial uh, support. I mean, um, like we're talking about Osama bin Laden, like mm. the, the most wanted person, right? Still so many years passed. I mean, all we're looking for him, we haven't found him. So yeah. would you say that um, the more, I mean, the terrorist group has um, financial support, the more it has chances of surviving and succeeding in its uh, uh, goals? I think, ultimately, it's one of the things that you're looking for, of course. Um, and I think it's very hard to survive if you have no money at all. However, I think it's more important to be supported by people. You know, I think uh, community support is more important for the survival of an organization, a terrorist organization, if you want, than financial support. Usually, if you have community support, well, a consequence of that will be... Well, you, uh, I think there are, limits. there are limits to that. I think that you can probably buy um, you know, a little bit of loyalty, but not the ultimate loyalty. Oh, well, we can argue about that, but ultimately... What's happening in Afghanistan? Yes. Well, that's the old Afghan saying, an Afghan can't be bought, but he can be wrenched, you know. Um, <laughs> and, and not for me, it's, it's an Afghan told me that. Um, but, but, you know, arguably, yes, arguably, yes, it is important to have financial means. But I think it is ultimately more important to actually develop some genuine support. And I think that often violence is risking that support. However, and this is the important point, I think that at some point, if you're a very rich organization, there can be a point where your wealth is actually sustaining the conflict. And that's what we're seeing in places like Colombia, uh, where organizations like the FARC are generating so much money by taxing um, um, the growers of uh, coca um, that they have no interest, really, in finding a settlement or solution. If you generate three, four hundred million dollars a year in income from taxing these people in areas that are under your control, what incentive do you have to actually find an accommodation with the government? And, and so I think if, if, if money, and, and at that point, arguably, they cease to be political organizations and actually de facto become criminal cartels, you know, because actually the political motive is no longer the dominant one, but the financial motive is the dominant one. Do you have time for one more question? Yeah. But I do want to say that we're going to open up our e-classroom for people to post their questions. So okay. If you've got time after class, sure. we can sure. continue the discussion. You, yeah. Yeah, sorry, but you had it. Yeah, I think yeah, there's a, a topic maybe it's called issues of scale. Uh huh. For example, after the 9-11, I think less than a year after Ramsey Clark published an article in the Atlantic Monthly that said, if the terrorists were to get them all in America and a big college football game, and yeah. some other targets of opportunity. The Constitution would be out of the window. Well, that's I what you said. Out of the window because you're the. I mean, everybody in America was in their living room peeking out of their curtains when, you know, when the first planes were hijacked, even yeah. before 9/11. I mean, we scare very easily as a species, and but uh, we didn't predict any any cataclysm had to do more otherwise from those kinds of attacks. But he did say that there's lots of places that terrorists could do something if they wanted to. Then he was mm. criticized for exposing all these ideas to the end of the world. He said, how stupid do you think I am? But what, and maybe in Israel, it'd be coming near to mm. violence because how many cafes can you hit? You know, yeah. What else can yeah. you get to? Yeah. But how does scale relate to these, the target, the opportunities? The Absolutely. And I, I think that's a question that when I'm asked, I can never really completely answer, to be 
completely honest with you because you know every society is full of targets and full of opportunities and 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 you know uh, if we really want to make for example this country or any other free society completely safe against terrorism then it ceases to be a free country uh, you cannot protect any target or every target everywhere um, if you walk down the street here you're a terrorist, you will see dozens of opportunities to strike. And ultimately, or malls, football games, I mean, there's no end to it, you know, and you can never come to the point where you're actually securing these places. And the question is, why don't terrorists do all these things? Why is more happening? Absolutely. Why isn't more happening? And I don't have an answer to that question. The sort of liberal answer, left-wing answer would be because there aren't actually any terrorists. And this is invented by Fox News and... and I don't believe that. I know for fact. You know, I mean, yeah. And I, 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 sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. I, I count myself as a liberal, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to include, uh, insult my own race. What's the conservative answer? The conservative answer. Our forces are so strong they can't touch us. Something like that. Something along these lines. And but I don't really have an, an answer that would would explain it. I don't know. I think they could, they could do a lot more if they were clever. The answer is there aren't that many people who are willing to kill themselves who have any opportunities other than the forces hmm. in Palestine. Yeah. yeah. And, so, and, and another answer would be that perhaps it isn't quite as easy as one imagines. Yeah. And uh, th this is my last word. Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, I, I wouldn't advise you, but if you, because people always talk about um, bomb making instructions on the internet. You know, that's like one of the favorite stories. Oh, you go on the internet and you can download bomb, and you can. But I would not advise you, unless you are trained in this, to try to construct one. Because it's actually more difficult than it seems. And in the first five years of the IRA's campaign in Northern Ireland, more IRA volunteers were killed trying to make bombs then were killed by the security forces. It took uh, uh, over two decades to develop the skill in that organization to actually build really, really good bombs. And even at the height, at their peak of technical expertise, only three people in the organization were building the bombs. Security forces could tell from the explosion, from the things that they traced, which particular individual had, had built that bomb. So don't try to build bombs. And what they say about you know, the guy in, in, in New York Times Square, you know, he clearly, you know, he followed some instruction and it didn't work out. And that happens more often than not if you're not an experienced uh, and skilled bomb maker. Trump. I hope yeah. that's just to say that for the IRA, that obviously before the internet. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Okay. Peter, thank, thank you so you. much. So for the second half of the class, um, we are going to hear from uh, Shaska Byerly, who, as I mentioned, used to be Vice President of ICNC. She's now one of our senior advisors and is doing uh, research on civil resistance and anti-corruption campaigns. Um, so I'll hand it over to her. Thank you. Well, who is ready to do some work? <laughs> mm? <laughs> You're going to do some work soon. Um, and you're, you're going to get to watch uh, some really uh, uh, interesting uh, short documentaries. So I want to thank Peter for his excellent presentation. And uh, you also gave a great segue into this part. And let me get my notes because I wrote something down, which was you said something at the very end, which is really true. And it, it ties together these two sec uh, sections. You said that um, terrorist groups ultimately um, don't work, they lose their support, and someone asked if, if people, like if they, if they can have access to a regular source of income, uh, if that sort of sustains them. And you gave a very, you made a very important point, which was that when groups like this get access to some regular sort of income, they ultimately start, uh, start becoming basically crime syndicates rather than terrorist groups. Not that one is better than the other. Uh, I would lump them together in any case. Um, but um, that's very true. And one of the reasons why this happens is because of corruption. Corruption is an enabler of these kinds of relationships. 
So what I will um, talk to you very briefly about for 10 minutes uh, before we break into a group exercise is um, corruption and the um, nexus between, I mean, the nexus between corruption and violent mm -hmm. conflict and the role of civil resistance and how that can break up this nexus. Essentially, what citizens can do, everyday people, to first curb corruption, gain accountability, gain their rights, often in situations in which there is violent conflict. Uh, and violent conflict is going on all over the world. Some of it is related to terrorism. Uh, some of it is related to other forms of violent conflict. Um, so what I'd first like to do is briefly just uh, talk a little bit about why is corruption linked to violent conflict? I think I'm doing this right. Yes. Okay. There are a number of reasons how corruption is linked to violent conflict. Um, the first one is in war. Uh, there, is a, there are war economies. Uh, there are economies in peacetime and there are economies in wars. And in war economies, um, corruption is essential for the whole, the whole process to continue. Um, so these economies function through malfeasance, through graft, through illicit practices. Um, and so war, in a sense, is enabled by these kinds of relationships. And um, without, so corruption becomes part of a war effort. And that's why, for example, after a war is over, one of the biggest challenges in peace building is addressing corruption because it has become so much enmeshed into practically every single activity in the society. The second way in which corruption is linked to violent conflict has to do with bloody confrontations. Corruption can draw out bloody confrontations, different kinds of violent conflicts. Can anybody think of an example where that's happening right now? Afghanistan, Afghanistan is one. Um, Democratic Republic of uh, DRC is another. Uh, Mexico is another. Niger Delta, uh, yeah. So this is a, a corruption enables these things to continue. A third way that corruption is linked to violent conflict has to do with stimulating social unrest. So when you have a, a society in which there is endemic corruption, in, in, and by that I mean that corruption is a part of practically every sector of the society, that it is linked to governance, that it is linked to the political um, uh, apparatus in the, in, the, in the society, that it's linked to the private sector, that it's linked to education, that it's linked to um, so social services, that it's linked to the media, when it's basically everywhere, um, this can stimulate a lot of social unrest um, and foment violent conflict. Someone mentioned uh, Niger Delta, uh, Darren. I mean, that's an example of, again, it's linked. So you see that actually corruption has, has multiple, in a way it functions in multiple ways, even in the same situation. So in Niger Delta, I mean basically a, a, an area that is so rich in natural resources and yet one of the poorest places on earth. The corruption is woven into the fiber of the society and this is really a huge hindrance uh, and facilitates the exploitation of the natural resources and facilitates the complete de degradation of the environment there and basically is creating a situation in which people have virtually no way to survive. And what is happening is that there's a huge youth population there, and these young people, particularly young men, are being recruited into these paramilitary groups in the Niger Delta. Corruption can also inhibit sustainable peace in post-conflict settings. So someone mentioned uh, Afghanistan. Well, I. I'm not sure if that exactly is a post-conflict setting because it seems to be continuing, or Iraq. Um, but clearly, uh, it does inhibit the uh, uh, sustainable peace. And uh, finally, and this is related to, su to sustainable peace, it, corruption can really um, weaken fragile and new democracies. Uh, part, some coming out of violent conflicts, some that may be uh, coming out of, uh, you know, authoritarian or totalitarian regimes, but corruption really weakens that, and it can enable state capture. So someone, uh, Trump mentioned uh, Mexico. I mean, that was 
uh, not the strongest of democracies, and now uh, basically the the country is, I mean, who knows what what's going to happen, but clearly uh, state capture is underway, and we can see that by um, the the, uh, the attacks virtually every single day uh, that are going on around the country by uh, narco groups. So what happens? I think maybe some of you are already thinking of this that. In a way, there's a vicious cycle that develops between corruption and violent conflict. And um, you may have a situation where you have an authoritarian government or ineffectual governance in a country, a weak democracy or a fragile democracy. And when that's paired with endemic corruption, then what happens is that there's a further delegitimization of authority in that, in that uh, state. And, the, and, there's a, and there's a lack of, um, there's a, basically a breakdown of rule of law. And then once you have that happening, then, you, then that leads to what we could call a fragmented tyranny, in which people are living under what is the equivalent of a tyranny. Um, whether or not the state is authoritarian or semi-democratic or democratic, the experience for the everyday person is one of tyranny. And that tyranny is because of different groups that are, that are, that are engaged in violence. So it can be parts of the, gov uh, the military, it can be parts of, it can be non-state groups like paramilitary groups. It can be groups that are actually linked to the government but are not, uh, but are non-state also. So for the average person, the experience is tyranny. What that leads is to then a further, uh, uh, cycle in which then that reinforces ineffectual governance. It can reinforce authoritarianism in the system. So it goes on and on. What can we do? Um, you all have been thinking about civil resistance now for um, many weeks. I mean, if we think about civil resistance, it actually can activate an anti-corruption cycle. Uh, because what do nonviolent social movements and grassroots campaigns do? They create alternative loci of power in a society, power that people generate. And that alternative loci of power, or it can be one, or it can many, be many loci of power within a society, that can start impacting this corruption, violent conflict nexus. And once that cycle starts, then that is a reinforcing cycle too, because then people be, will become more and more empowered and then they will tackle other problems in the society or continue to tackle huge problems in the society like corruption. So people have the capacity to break this vicious cycle. And it's not a theory. I mean, this is actually what people are doing around the world. So before we break up into groups, because um, we don't have a lot of time, I just thought it would be interesting to think about corruption in, um, in, a, an, al in an alternative way. The traditional definition of corruption is that it's the misuse of entrusted power for private gain. And this is the, uh, the definition that has been developed by Transparency International, the global sort of umbrella anti-corruption movement in the world. It's a really good definition. There's nothing wrong with it. So I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not going to criticize the definition. It describes very well what is corruption. However, we can think about corruption a different way. And we can think about it strategically in terms of how we fight corruption. And when we think about it in terms of fighting corruption rather than describing it, we can come up with a, a new approach to it. So another way to think about corruption is that it's a system. It's not just two people engaged in, a, in an illicit transaction. It's not... Um, even four people, or six, or eight, or a thousand. It's actually a system. And so it's a system that involves a complex set of relationships. There are many relationships. They're, they're convoluted. It's hard to figure them out. And what one may see on the surface is not what may actually be going on behind or under the surface. So one may see a, a few sets of relationships. Below that are multiple sets of relationships. So it's really complex. And it involves established vested interests. That means that people have a vested interest in this system, and they want it to continue. They're deriving benefits from that system. It can be power. It can be uh, status. It can be 
uh, financial gain. It can be other kinds of gain, uh, like you know, getting your 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 son or daughter into a prestigious prestigious university, or being able to buy a, a condominium at a reduced price, or getting a gift of a car. I mean, many different kinds of things. So, people have vested interests. And these vested interests that are embedded into these relationships actually cut across the political, economic, and social forces within a society. So corruption is complex. So it's not just about changing this tiny micro-relationship between two people. It's about impacting the system. And the advantage that we bring as uh, scholars and practitioners of civil resistance is that we understand this because we understand that civil resistance is about one disruption disrupting the status quo and two winning people over to our side both from the general public and from the power holders or the oppressors or the corruptors in the society and finally I want to give you a third definition and this definition was developed by Aruna Roy, who was one of the founders of the Mazdor Kishan Shakti Sangatan movement in India. And you can get some information about that. Um, we'll post some things on the internet. I won't go into it. But this was a brilliant 10-year campaign uh, of, on, that, uh, on right to information, and it is having an impact all around the world. And what she says is that corruption is the external manifestation of the denial of a right, uh, of the denial of an entitlement, of the denial of a wage, of a medicine. And so what she is saying is that when you think about the experience of corruption by the average person in society, it's about the denial of something or the loss of something. It can even be about the loss of their freedom. And all of these things are related to freedom in a sense. Because if one cannot get medicine when one is dying, one does not have freedom. If one is losing an entitlement, uh, such as a pension that you know, a widow uh, needs, uh, a poor widow is entitled to a pension, a tiny pension which allows her to survive, that is a loss. And it's a, and it's a denial of freedom to survive. So moving on, because we don't have enough time. I'm going to ignore this slide. You can read about it in the paper that's posted. Um, except I would just say one thing. There is a general assumption in traditional top-down approaches to fighting corruption. And that assumption is that once you put anti-corruption structures in place in a government and in a society, the illicit practices will change. But if you think about it, how are you going to get the change if those who are benefiting from the corruption are oftentimes the very ones who are expected to make the changes? On their own, how are they going to do it? It's very difficult. It doesn't happen a lot. So here is the strategic value of civil resistance. And this is the last conceptual thing I'm going to say. And then you're going to break up into groups. If the system, if there's a system that's corrupt, it's not enough to try to put the change from within because those ha all those people with vested interests in all these corrupt relationships are not going to want to change it. It needs a push from the outside. One of those sources of outside pressure are citizens. And that's the strategic advantage that we have when, citi when citizens engage themselves in civil resistance, in nonviolent campaigns and movements to curb corruption. So here are some of the different kinds of tactics that citizens in nonviolent campaigns and movements use. Some of them will be very familiar to you. Others you may think, wow, I never thought that that could be a nonviolent tactic. Like um, social and economic empowerment initiatives? Maybe you've thought about that before. Um, um, let's see what else. Social audits? Some of you in one group are going to learn about that. Um, street theater and stunts? Big thing in anti-corruption campaign. Uh, monitoring of officials? This is a good one. Monitoring of institutions, budgets, spending, public services. These are amazing nonviolent tactics. 
And this is how civil resistance that targets corruption has expanded the field of civil resistance broadly. Because normally when we think about civil resistance, we think about how it's applied to, dicta to dictatorships or occupations. But people are engaging in this. They may not call it civil resistance, but this is what they're doing. They're engaging in this in many innovative ways, and it's changing the way uh, we as scholars and practitioners and people in development institutions think about fighting corruption and think about the possibilities of change that people can bring about. So that's it for my presentation. So now you're going to get to work. I'm going to pass around a paper, uh, some instructions. If the group can just basically divide into two, half of you, so this side and this side. This side can go into the next room. This side can stay here. Each of you are going to watch an 18-minute video of a nonviolent uh, campaign to curb corruption. I assure you that the people in these campaigns did not, real, did not call themselves civil resistance campaign to curb corruption. They had broader goals, yet they were very, very much related to what people felt in their hearts and what people experienced in their lives. So you will watch different videos. Both will be on, on um, the ICNC site, You'll, so each of you will be able to watch the other one. And what I'd like you to do is we have very little time, is to watch the video and then in each of your group identify together what were the objectives of the campaign. I've got this written down, but what were the objectives of the campaign? I have here three nonviolent tactics. Let's reduce it to two. <laughs> you'll find, you'll see many, but pick two that you think are really creative or unusual or that you felt were really um, effective for the particular context in which it occurred. And then pick two general lessons learned. I had three down, but pick just two. And pick something that you think from this campaign that you've just learned about, you think might be applicable to others around the world who want to tackle corruption. And then pick a, pers a spokesperson, and we're going to get back together here for 10 minutes, and each group is going to have five minutes to report back to the other group about what they discovered. In many places around the world, funds are being handed over to members of parliament for the development in their communities. There is something essentially wrong with the scheme. Legislators are not supposed to run social programs. It is our prerogative to actually ask what it is that the government is doing with our money. We can never know where the money goes if the doors are closed. We really want all of us, all the stakeholders, all, all the actors in, in this business to realize that one, CDF is a good idea. We, we want to make it work. I mean, our country uh, is, is a poor country. And CDF Section 3 of the Act expressly says the fund is to fight poverty. In principle, the idea of CDF is quite noble if it is used for the right purposes. But right now, there is a lot of mismanagement, um, corruption, and the development that the people are really yearning for is still 
a pipe dream. This fund has enormous potential to begin to make people at the community level understand that public funds are their funds. However, these funds have been fraught with all kinds of problems. The law gives excessive powers to parliamentarians to pick the committee, and as a result of that, it is all the more important that communities at the ground learn how to track these funds, how to know what happens to them, and how to demand from the government what they want. We are Muslims for Human Rights, Muhuri. We try to facilitate communities to take up the struggle for human rights realization on their own. We sort of like looked at the avenues available for them to, you know, try and uh, reduce the levels of poverty within their midst because it's poverty that basically uh, renders them vulnerable to violations of so many kinds. We begin with social audit. So we are now going to the CDF offices. All the CDF documents that uh, we work with for the social audits are normally gotten from the CDF offices. It's very difficult for a common monaishi, a lay person to come just straight to this office and access information. He didn't receive any warning letters. From We're all reluctant uh, for obvious reasons that uh, you know, somebody cannot just walk into your office wanting to look at your books. I don't, I don't, I don't know why that happens. In Kenya, we don't have a, a, a Freedom of Information Act or Access to Information Act. We need to start some kind of a new tradition, a culture, to build that in our systems of governance, that information is a right to every person. The right to know is the right to live. What we do usually is we first uh, do public education, talking to communities, explaining to them that this is your money. We're currently having a social audit in the Likoni constituency of uh, Mombasa. And when I say social audit, I basically mean monitoring the expenditure that's been part of the constituency development fund. And it basically gives people an opportunity to ask questions of the government. How the money is being spent, whether it's being spent well or not. It's really exciting because once the people have access to those records, completely and totally immerse themselves into the files. They're looking at these documents for the first time and they're saying, oh look, this is how much they spent on, you know, on this office building and this is how much they built, you know, they've spent on a water tank. It's interesting to see the reactions that come out of people the minute they have access to information. What is happening as per the allocation of funds related to the development of that particular area? We are taxpayers. Tunalipa tax. Nazile ndio zinafanya zile miradi yote. My knowledge by itself can be an instrument of changing policy. We have a theater team. We call it the communications team. 
And basically the work of the communications team is to go out to the people, to talk to them about CDF, what it means, and why they need to get involved. So it's participatory education theater, that's what we call it. coming with the project checkup. We are going to measure each and every point of the classroom in order for us to take the exact measurement and see if they differ from the BQ we are having in the files. We start from the floor, then we go to the wall. Yes. How do we see it? Is it fair? Is it good? Yes. Is it very good or is it poor? They are saying that there are two classes here and we have found a lot of things is uncompleted. These are the windows. It's uncompleted also, and they've used cheap material. They are saying there are 12 windows, while there are only eight. They're talking of two, do two doors, but there's only one door. And they were also talking of the blackboard, but this is a wall, and they just painted it. And they said they've completed all this thing. And it's painted, but it's in un incompleted. Mwema <laughs> 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 Tunahitaji kwa hivyo kama kuna hiyo njia ya kufanya ipesa ipatikane hizo mm. katasi mnaweza mm. tuonyesha pamoja na nyinyi hao walio saini hapo tunaweza kuwafuatilia tukauliza pesa mlipeleka wapi yeah. na wamesema watakuja kwa hivyo tuwaomba na nyinyi yeah. muje pale yeah. muwaulize yeah. tarehe nne bomani sanane sanane wasema watakuja mtu yoyote mwenye maswali ajitoe sote takuwa kwa hivyo tuwaomba tafadhali muje muwaulize zangu salamu kwa nyote mulo asili when i got in this morning i was told that muhuri was raided at around 2:30 in the morning by a gang of nine people and uh, one of the security guards was uh, stabbed at the neck. During a training, we've never had a direct security threat in the process of auditing. If they came to rob the documents we are having, it seems there's something so big that they're hiding. In fact, they're giving us more motivation for us to go for more information. Yoni hakika kama mauti saa kumina moja na dakika sita kwa saa za mji mtakatifu wa maka zilizo sawia na za Afrika ya mashariki. Hii ni Radio Salam 90.7. Usikuwa kwa mkia jana katika kule tunapofanya training, tuliingiliwa. Mejaribu kututisha. Kwa hivyo kuliingiliwa, nadhani mulisikia kwa mba yule mlinzi wa pala lidungwa kisu cha shingo. Kwa hivyo usikuwa kwa mkia leo, wananchi wenye walikoni walikuwa pale, wakisema tutabaki na tutalinda hii kazi, mpaka kesho pale takapokuwa tuatoa zile habari ya ile kazi tunayendelea. Kwa hivyo hilo ni kwetu, moja wapo ya yale mambo ambayo tunaona tumeweza kupata ya neotupa moyo kabisa. Leo tukiwa hapa, tunahakika tunaweza kuchallenge na wao kwa sababu kwa kutokana na zile takabadhi tuzilozo pata. Hatubahatishi. Tunasema ukweli. Sasa katika yale miradi kutembelea kwetu, ndio tukazipata zile tafauti. Tungeomba pia wananchi wote wanaosikia, hata kama si eneo bunge likoni, wana haki kuja kufahamu na kuelewa ili pia wailimishe wenzao na watete haki zao. Na ni mpaka wananchi wao wenyewe wajitokeze kikamilifu kama kwa mikutano ile inayopangwa na vikundi vya kijamii kama huu wetu wa kesho pale Bomani sanane. Wajitokeze waoneshe ile you know uh, nia yao ya kuona mabadiliko yameletwa bila ya hiyo basi sisi wenyewe wananchi ndio tutakuwa tuendelea tukiumia na wanasiasa wakifaidi
za CDF zilizofanywa hivi siku zilizopita zilifanywa na wakazi wa hapa hapa likoni Mimi na wewe moja kwa moja tuna jukumu kuhakikisha kwamba pesa zile zimetunufaisha vile inavyostahili ndio tumeweza kupata fursa ya kuweza kukagua ile miradi ambayo imetekelezwa na kusimamiwa na kamati za CDF ambazo tupo nazo hapa leo nitapenda kuhakikishia kitu kimoja kwamba nia zetu si za kisiasa tumekuja hapa ili tupiane maarifa la kwanza la pili tupate kujua mambo ambayo yanatendeka katika nchi hii mambo kuhusu ufisadi kwa majina naitwa Mope Halfani ni mkazi wa Likoni nazaliwa hapa hapa Bofu Wodi narudi sasa kuleta ripoti za mradi wa Majisafi Primary School tukapata kuwa kandarasi ama zile ko contractor hakuwa anatenda notice kandarasi za zabuni hazikutangazwa hali ya mradi ni kuwa umemalizika lakini hakukuwa na ile certificate of completion yani sitakawadi inaonesha kuwa ile mradi umemalizika nataka kuzungumzia mradi wa Mtongwe Primary School ukarabati wa madarasa saba ulikuwa umetengewa kiwango cha shilingi milioni moja na laki moja na zikatumika shilingi laki tisa, mianari na sabini na nne alfu baadhi ya vitu ambavyo vilikuwa vinakosekana katika stakabadhi ambazo ni muhimu wakati wa kupeana tenders kwa sababu tumekuja kuelezwa pesa zetu zimefanya kazi namna gani tunajua bei ya mawe tunajua bei ya leba tunataka hiyo yote isemwe ili kujue pesa zimetumika namna gani tuendelee na tusema nakuja kuzungumzia masuala ya basari kama uwe na uhusiano kama mjukuu wake rafiki ya babako kitu namna hiyo tuko na watu waliotoa ushuhuda kuwa wampewa hizo basari sasa tujiulizeni tuelekea wapi sisi walikoni tuelekea wapi aswa hii basari tutaipata kweli ikiwa tuna uhusiano wa karibu na mheshimiwa ama mtu aliyeko katika kamati mwananchi yote wa constituency ya likoni ana haki ya kupata basari hivi sasa tumepata forms 1553 Shule zetu hapa ni nyingi na watoto ni wengi. Huwezi kuwapa watu wote ndugu zangu. Lazima wengine wapate. When I look at the social audit process across the world, the response is the same. Once the people have access to those records, there's a sea change in their attitude. That's when they realize that okay this is information that I've never seen in my life that I might not be able to access very easily. That's there in front of me today. Let me see what I can do with it. I think what what the social audit methodology has has shown is its adaptability to different contexts that it can work in a number of different places and so what we've done in Kenya is what they've done in India and hopefully they'll be able to do elsewhere as well and hopefully what we've managed to create here will ultimately help empower communities elsewhere. It is inspirational to see how kids, teenagers, women have taken up the task. For when I was watching was that kind of allowing um, normal citizens to feel like they're taking part in um, something bigger they could their opinions could have an impact um, especially dealing with government money could, I'm sure a lot of people could say that there um, there wasn't really anything that they could do about it so not only presenting a problem but presenting um, a way to combat that problem by um, organizing and becoming um, better informed Other lessons since we started on that question, lessons that that, that folks saw from this one. Well, it's maybe a little bit. I found it uh, really inspirational that when <clears throat> they were finally confronting the government or the, the MPs, uh, not that they didn't have one spokesperson, but several men and women, each telling part of the story and getting up and speaking. And I, I don't know. I thought that was empowering. I think one one lesson that I saw was. Uh, and I guess we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. This idea of, of backfire, where you know their meeting was attacked by these nine thugs and came in and stabbed them, but it actually just emboldened their movement even more, saying like, "Well, they must be hiding something now. <laughs> you know, there's probably some piece of information we have that they really don't want us to get." And I think it definitely mo mobilized more people in the movement as opposed to intimidate them. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And the initial level of existence was just saying, you have no right to this, nobody can get to this, nobody, and so they just rolled right over that. You know, they just kept asking until they got it, because there was no basis for the indignation. I think they empower their communities, and they succeed because last year they passed the, the Right Access of Information Act in the Kenyan Parliament, and it's when they empower more communities and they make some pressure on the MBs, and this is why I think it's a huge achievement for uh, uh, mobilizing people uh, on uh, government records and details. I think another one that came to me at the end was that, well, actually, when they're doing a site visit, which is like, don't let any little thing slip. You know, it's like, they said they're going to put in three windows, and they only put in two. Or they said this is going to be this many inches, and there's only this many inches. Because I feel like a lot of these things, it's like a very slippery slope where it's like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll get away with this, we'll shave a little money yeah. here. And before you know it, the, the school, the entire structure doesn't even get put up. And so they were very diligent in making sure that every single thing that was laid out was was, was followed. So I thought that was we're all turning into Germans. There. <laughs> <laughs> Not always a good thing. Right. <laughs> Let's just get the blueprints. Right. Get the blueprints. Yeah. Okay. So what about um, two nonviolent tactics? Um, ones that you thought were particularly creative, unusual, or relevant to the particular context? Why don't we? Um, Maybe we can just go around the, the circle. We can start with you. I think like the community theater was interesting, and I don't know if anyone's worked on African projects, but it's really effective in that context. So I thought it was interesting that they would use that and to, I don't know, to influence. Opinion. Was the whole thing was a social audit, or so that's not really a tactic? Then that's like a set of tactics, mm -hmm. right? Well, I thought the social audit was, was one, like s the street performances were, it was were a different social, one. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and then the education and the empowerment. Right, and the, the trainings and the, the march and... Mm. So you, you thought the social audit just in the larger context was... Just um, getting youth involved, whether it was using music during marches or something where it was kind of all-inclusive. I thought uh, going to the Supreme Court to challenge uh, the law was really was a really effective way, to, uh, really effective tactic to use, because it's another form of government that you know can obviously supersede the, the parliament. Uh, yeah, I was going to say just music too, and just kind of how that just energizes the movement and gets everybody all psyched up and riled up. I think that's important. I think how they adopt the idea in the local context, because the main idea in Kenya is the poverty. And how we combat the poverty, they, they came with the idea of social audit. I think it's amazing when they, they, they have the, the local context. You know, from a nonviolent uh, civil disobedient movement, the most significant thing I thought was social accountability. That you know, this is for our money. We need to manage it, and we have a right in over these things. So I thought it was it was very very important, not just for corruption, for anything that you know any woman wants to do. So accountability was to me rather than audit. Audit I have problem with. You know, there presupposes certain standards and certain things, and you know your audit may not be my audit, and there are various things. Whereas accountability is something that is simple and that is fundamental to any movement. Yeah, I kind of agree with, with Radwan um, with the how it was so local. They, they brought all these different people from different communities in the county to this one sort of meeting where they energized them, they showed them all this information that they couldn't have gotten otherwise. And they're like, okay, go out in pairs, both of you, and go back to your community and you know measure this and find out if people are supportive of this movement. And you know they would bring them back to this huge sort of conference they had. So. Yeah, I think the uh, the audit was central to the whole notion because just the concept that one group has to allocate it and the other group has to monitor it. People who allocate it can't also monitor it or it can't be controlled, can't be understood. So I think the, the audit was functional. When it came to mobilizing people in addition to the street theater, I really liked that they arrived at the community instead of just giving them a lecture of what happened, just directly showing them the budget saying, look, According to these records, the school's built here. Where's the school? And then they themselves start 
uh, and asking questions and, and posing questions for themselves. And so right away, you know, you get that, that uh, and, uh, passion to do, to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Two, two things that haven't been, been mentioned yet, I think. Um, one is the use of, of local radio to inform and to mobilize. The other is, is how they frame the issue. Because they frame it like this isn't, this isn't state money or this isn't the money of the politicians, but this is your money which is being abused, which, which gives people an entirely different ownership to the issue, because if, I, if someone messes with your money, then it's getting personal. <laughs> and then people get angry, and then you can mobilize them. Mm. So, Dan, can I ask a question? <laughs> <laughs> because doesn't this, again, show that, you know, the whole thing with civil resistance, that you do need, like, a, basically a little bit of openness in the system? Because all the things that we're yeah. talking about, going to the radio station, going to the courts, mm -hmm. getting this stuff in the first place, you know, getting those bureaucrats to give you that sort of information, all depends on them being willing to do that. I, right when, it, in Syria, you couldn't go to a court, you couldn't go to the radio station, and you probably wouldn't get the information. So that campaign... But that reflects the development of the society, because yeah. in a society that had more codified regulations, it would be much harder to do those things. Here, they say, no, you can't have it, and you say, yes, we can, give it to us, and then you get it in a place where there were more laws, as uh, happened in other countries reported in the paper that was by the author of the whole study. There, was, mm. there were countersuits, and there were lawsuits, and in one place, one of the NGOs or CGOs was was sued by the state because of illegal action, but then because the state had signed an international agreement, they, mm. they, the CGO prevailed in the courts. So it depends on the development of the, the state of development of the civilization, what's possible. In terms of lessons learned, just to kind of build upon what other people said, I thought it was really interesting that they um, used something that was so concrete, like a specific example of, you know, um, differences in windows or things like that, and whether or not that could be applicable to other social movements. Because I was just thinking inside myself, like, when you're delegating responsibilities within a movement, what's so interesting, I think, about this example and, and what's easily applied to kind of, uh, like, a variety of, of potential, I don't know, volunteers, is that it's easy. It's kind of say, like, look over these numbers and go check and see if the school has windows, you know? If there's a way to apply that. But, you know, I was just thinking about that, you know. But there really is. Mm -hmm. I mean, counting is magic. Mm -hmm. They reported another case in this paper today was the number of school textbooks that were being delivered versus the number being purchased. Mm -hmm. And when they started counting the textbooks, the number that were delivered doubled. But to me, to a political movement, that's what I was trying to think, like, like how can we kind of, this quantifiable way of engaging people. I don't, I don't think it's I don't think it's utilized enough and well, I agree, I agree but find something you can count and count and find the shortages yeah. and ask where the difference is yeah but I've had personal experience with that one yeah. well I, I, one thing I want to add in terms of a tactic and just to build off last week is just citizen journalism I mean there was somebody behind the camera who was you know, made that whole film. And what I thought was really cool is I think definitely people will march in a certain way, will prepare their speeches, or really liven up a bit if they know that this is being filmed and that this is going to be spread to potentially thousands, if not millions, more people. I can't remember what the, the count was on uh, YouTube, but I think it was up to almost 9,000 people had viewed it. And I just think it's brilliant that I don't know how much they spent putting this film together. I mean, it was well done, but, um, you know, this is something that otherwise would have happened in, in Mombasa and, and you know we would have never heard of this but because somebody had a, had a camera and captured this and interviewed folks um, framed the whole struggle in a, in a certain way and a nice 18 minute video I think it, that's a, a substantial part of making the movement successful but who did fund that? Who were I, I don't know you have to so IVP? That, that's, that's who it was? yeah because it was the song that was, was who were here so. uh, yeah. interesting one thing that surprises me, why was not a computerized system ever considered? I asked this question from a personal example. I worked in a country where we had to reform corruption in a particular department. And it was, you know, millions of dollars, and it was the health department in that country. 
and everyone wanted, including the minister and the new president, said, look, we need to end this right here, help. Nothing is going to the health center such in terms of that. We called in the Transparency International just to understand, you know, where the issues were. And to cut the whole narrative short, actually, we established more or less a transparent system. First in bidding, you know, that really put everything. Here is the tender. Here is the proposal. Here are the proposals. Here is how it is awarded. It was all there in terms of what needs to be done. Then a system of awarding money to the health centers and it went to the district level. And they had to have a little small system where anybody could go in and check in terms of what needs to be done. So I was just wondering, you know, of course, you know, a computer system cannot be produced in a week or a month. It is a, it, it is a process. It only but we found enough. transparency, you know, in the award and in the procurement and in personal management reduced, if not completely eliminated, corruption. It only so, works if you have good controls. I think your it's a, Your information system is as good as your controls. Yeah. If you can't validate the yeah. inputs, you, can, yeah. you have another method. I wouldn't say it eliminated corruption much. Yeah. You know, corruption is as old as, you know, old, old as profession. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to do it. Exactly. Overnight. But it's substantially yes. reduced, yeah. if you will, the level. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you spend three or four years in a country, you move on. And then what happens is quite another yeah. But transparency to me was very important. And I didn't get from the movie the issue of how transparency was addressed. Mm -hmm. Trump, let's give you the last word. Yeah, just as a hopefully interesting aside, um, social audit or public audit, as it's also called, is also being used by many development organizations to, to detect fraud uh, among subcontractors, for example. So they would, for example, in a building project, they would post the accounts uh, locally so that local people could come and tell them, you've been paying too much to this contractor. You, this isn't really the cost of cement, mm -hmm. and so on. So that, uh, so, 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 so this method is being used in many, many different contexts, actually, also international. Yes, yes. Um, first, I'd like to thank you all for your interest and for, you know, what, you know, your interest in the subject and for thinking together. And I'll look forward to seeing um, uh, your postings. I'll definitely uh, follow up. And one thing I forgot to mention, which I think will give you some interesting background, too, about the, the significance of this civil resistance campaign, as I would call it. Um, I'm putting my terminology in it. Um, but this area of Kenya was the site of violent conflict, violent ethnic conflicts, both in 1997 and most recently in 2008, after um, the um, elections. So this is not a calm area. It is also an area of complete abject poverty. Um, and I have met with um, Hussein Khalid, whom you saw, and he has told me that the people there had absolutely no confidence in themselves. They had, uh, they were completely apathetic. They were fearful because people who do express dissent do get beaten um, and uh, and threatened. And they also had this very interesting belief that I found in, in other um, contexts as well. They believed that it wasn't their responsibility to do anything about these, the, all of this corruption and, and the problems that were going on. They somehow felt it was beyond them. It was up to the government, or it was up to the, quote, NGOs, those rich organizations in the capital city. Um, they got lots of money from international donors. Um, and so they felt they, they basically were irrelevant to anything that, pot, any change that could happen. And so. When, when they first started out, they really had to make an effort to start first changing people's ideas about themselves and building their confidence and instilling in them a sense that they actually, it was their responsibility. Uh, even if the government should have been doing the right thing, uh, it still was their responsibility. And he told me that the fact that, um, that they transformed their thinking to realizing that they were part of the problem. As long as they remained, um, uh, indifferent or, or un, uh, uninvolved, they were as much responsible for these problems as was the government, and the or I wouldn't I wouldn't blame all the government, but the corrupt elements of the government. Thank you.